Total Screen proudly presents the Weekly Set Podcast with Tyson Gifford and William Rorick. Episode 243, recorded February 17, 2020. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Weekly Set, the official podcast of the Total Screen. I am your host. My name is Tyson, and joining me today, as always, is my partner in crime here at the Total Screen, William Rorick. Hello. So, today, we are not going to be talking about the magicians. We're not going to be talking about the Witcher like we talked about last week. We're not going to be talking about any show in particular that's on currently. Instead, we are going to be talking about the first season of Lost as part of our rewatch. So, if you follow this podcast, you know, we brought it up a few times that we are doing a big rewatch of Lost. One episode a day. We started 25 days ago, basically. And we've been going through, and we're going to go through the entire run of the series so that we finish the last episode, the series finale, on the 10-year anniversary in which the season finale orig- or series finale originally aired. But the way we're doing our discussion of it with this rewatch is that as we finish a season... We're going to do a podcast about it, and that's going to be that week's podcast instead of whatever else we were going to do. So this week, instead of The Magicians, we're doing Lost Season 1. We're going to catch up on all of the episodes of The Magicians we missed uh, next week. I believe it's actually three episodes, because when I was looking up on the internet, it looks like there were two episodes last week for some reason. I don't know why, but it seems like they did a double episode last week. Um, <laughs> so we'll have oh, to figure y- that out. Yeah, yeah, there was like two episodes of The Magicians last week, which is weird because, so I have uh, Hulu, I have Hulu set to like DVR it, mm-hmm. and I got so confused because like it, they ran both episodes back to back as like an, as like a two hour block apparently, uh-huh. uh, which is, you know, I, okay. But like when I went to like watch on Hulu, they had like the episodes separately and then they had like two hour block recorded like in between them and so like the episodes were like labeled something like like apocalypse now and then the next episode was oops i did it again and then the block recorded was labeled apocalypse oops i did it and i was like what (laughs) what is this i'm confused so it's strange that for some reason they just gave us two episodes last week without like any warning or just suddenly there's two episodes so next week when we talk about the magicians we're going to be talking about three episodes because we're going to be talking about those two plus the one that's airing this week that we we would normally be discussing next week so we'll catch up on the magicians next week is what i'm saying yes but now we're going to be talking about lost season one before that though i need to point out that we had a little bit of news that broke relating to loss that's going to affect our rewatch and i want to cover it just so everybody's aware and can keep up if they're watching along with us uh for some reason that escapes me <laughs> uh abc which is owned by disney uh it had been ha- having lost on Hulu because Disney owns Hulu. And now they've decided instead that they're going to put lost on IMDb TV, which is a free streaming thing. So you can watch it free with ads. Uh, but it's like owned by Amazon, I guess. I guess Amazon owns IMDb. I didn't know that before. Yes, but, they own IMDb. Yeah. So, so this isn't Amazon it. Prime video. This is like IMDb TV. You so, can watch it through, through Amazon. Yeah. You can uh, use the Amazon app, but if you want to watch it on like a computer, you're going to have to go to IMDb's website to watch it. I I refuse. What date is this happening? This is happening on May 1st. So it's towards the end. I I will power watch the rest of it on Hulu before (laughs) May 1st, because I don't want to watch it on IMDb DB TV with ads. When I have, when when on Hulu it's completely ad free and I don't have to sit through any crappy ads. No. Yeah, it's It's annoying. I have no idea why they're doing it. It's like even for for it being free, like I I have Hulu, but I have Hulu with ads so it's not going to be too much different for me. Probably more ads, but... It's weird putting it on a free service means it has to leave Hulu. That's stupid. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that. why they're doing it, because it's not It's not an Amazon property. It's an, It's a Disney property. Yeah. So why is Disney <laughs> giving giving it to them, apparently? Or I I have no idea why they're doing it. It's it's weird. Because they decided that their streaming services have to have as little value as possible. 
they're like, oh crap, there's too much good stuff on Hulu. We gotta make it more like Disney Plus, where there, where there just needs to be like one interesting show. So give, give away all the good stuff. They're like, wait, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. What's happening on Hulu makes too much sense. This just yes. cannot stand. So yeah, so this changes on May 1st. It's a, uh, it's a weird birthday gift for Disney to give me, but, uh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I guess. Thank you. So if you're going to keep up, it'll, it'll affect like the last, like two, like the very end of season five, I think. And then season six, the whole pretty much is going to be affected. So yeah. That's in the future. That's in the cards. <laughs> Just so you know, I needed to bring that up. But let's get into Lost Season 1. So before we get into talking about anything specific, I had kind of three questions that I wrote down. I kind of wanted us to address each. So first off is, how did the show hold up to your memory of it? So Will, uh, like, how did how did it hold up to how you remembered it in your head? Pretty well, actually. I mean, yeah, pretty, pretty well. I don't know. I don't quite know how to elaborate on that too much, except for, I mean, I mean, I remembered all the characters. Uh, you know, there, there might have been like specific, like plot stuff that happened that I didn't like remember happened, but it's like, the, it's like outside of like the characterization is like the big star of the season anyway. Like there's very little in an overarching plot, except for, like, the fact that they're stuck on the island and they're trying to survive. Yeah, survival's kind of the biggest thing, you know? And it's just yeah, kind of yeah. slowly introducing the little weird parts, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah, like, the mythology is being introduced in the season, so most of the season is just self con mostly self-contained stories involving involving stuff happening to the castaways on the island and and then just just like and just like the real meat of it is like the flashbacks and learning who these people are and what they're all about that's the big draw of the season is just getting familiar with the characters and you know what i i always say that this is lot the characterization has lost strength because you could say yeah this is if, if you take like the season Season overall, you could say, yeah, it's a pretty uneventful season, but I like that they take, like, an entire season to, like, really dive into these characters and get you familiar with them before mm -hmm. we get into, like, a lot of, like, the mythology and, like, really, like, a lot of the plot-driven stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. I have to say, I didn't remember it being paced as fast as it is. True. Actually, that's a good point. It's paced really fast. Like, every episode ends basically want leaving you wanting more. Like, that's that's the thing. Like, an episode ends, and I'm like, oh, and I gotta wait for next for tomorrow to watch the next episode. It's like... Actually, you're right, because these episodes go, like, you know, pretty snappy, and it's like, it's like, you, you don't have a chance to get bored with it. Yeah. Like, you're not sitting there going, okay, when is this episode going to end? Oh, shit, we still got 30 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I remember Damon Lindelof talking about how the show was designed for network TV. Because somebody was saying, like, would the show be better? They asked him, like, would the show be better if you did it now and, like, for, like, HBO or something? And he mm -hmm. said, like, uh, there's so much of what Lost is is based on, like, network TV. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, like, the ideas of, like, having cliffhangers at the end of every episode. Episode, but not just yeah. at the end of every episode, but it, but like at the point in which there'd be like a commercial break. So like whenever like there's frequently moments where it's like, oh, my God, something happened. And then you get that kind of moment where there would be a commercial break. And you know, you kinda that's don't... less evident when you're wa when you're rewatching yeah. it. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that's less evident when you're watching it on a streaming service with, like, literally no commercials. Yeah. Because, like, because you don't get the cliff, like, like, you, you, can, you know where the commercial breaks are because it cuts, it cuts out and there's, like, like a moment of, like, black and then it cuts back to the episode. So you could tell, like, that's a commercial break. It's always paced like a big musical cue right right before it cuts away. But I mean like the cliffhangers like they lose meaning in that context. So to some like, extent, but in, in, yeah. in another way, the fact that they have these like, cause, cause a cliffhanger by its very nature is like, is like a, a climax. It's like a mini well, climax. Yeah. It's designed to continue to, to keep you watching, you know, so like you don't just go away and do something else. Yeah. But just the very nature of them having these little mini climaxes throughout the episode, I think is part of what makes it pace so well. Yeah. Because it's like there's always something exciting happening. 
the episode could slow down and can get buried kind of in the character drama, which is good. But like, you know that, that like at a certain point, you know, it's like, okay, we're a few minutes away from where there'd be a commercial break. Something's going to happen. Yeah. That's, that's a good point because yeah, because while, while it is like the focus is on character drama, it's not like it, it, it's not like a bunch of people talking. There's always something happening. There's always something going on that makes it exciting. So it's not like just like two people. Like it's it's not like it's not just all dialogue, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's always something happening. I mean, there is a lot of dialogue. I mean, but yeah. <laughs> but there's al- there's there's always something happening on top of that that that's exciting that holds your interest. So you so you're not getting bored. Yes, exactly. And that that's something that like I think has kind of been missing a lot from TV because like a lot of the really good the kind of serialized shows aren't on network anymore. They're either on like premium cable like HBO or they're on like Netflix. Right. Or something. Yeah, this is kind of like old school TV, right? Old school like serial drama. Exactly. But the difference is, is that the stuff that's still on network today isn't as serialized or as like fantastical as no. something like this at all. Like not even remotely like anymore. Like it's it's gone full procedural. <laughs> not even when this aired, really. Yeah, I mean when this aired it was it was pretty revolutionary too with that. But I mean like even more so now I think like all the serialized stuff has moved away from network. Right. Like there's like nothing serialized on network anymore you know it's it's all procedural now yeah yeah yeah. they basically found they realized that their niche is to to stay away from the stuff that the streaming services do well you know it's interesting because yeah it's all procedural now uh there was there was a point after lost broke out and became a success that that they tried to duplicate it they tried to have these serialized like mystery mystery box shows yeah that tried to copy what lost did but they didn't they, they all they did completely it. missed the point <laughs> yeah they completely missed the point they all did it badly you know <laughs> they basically came they had like a heavy concept that was addressed in the first episode and then yeah. they had nowhere to go and that was the thing about lost is like what happens in the first episode a plane crash right that's that's it lost doesn't like yeah lost doesn't like hit you over the head with some big mystery like at the beginning you know they they don't like land you know in like fucking okinawa and like the in world war ii and then we have to figure out how did they travel through time i don't yeah. know <laughs> it's a mystery like yeah it, it yeah. doesn't give you the mystery right at once like it doles out the mysteries over time yeah yeah exactly it doles out the mystery. And, and some of the mysteries are, are are bullshit i mean the numbers don't don't end up going anywhere i think the i think the numbers are cool though because they're it's kind of like an easter egg hunt it is because but that's all, you that's watch all it, it they're everywhere those numbers are everywhere even before they ever bring them up right you'll yeah, see those right. numbers everywhere and it's like it's fun it's fun but that's all that's all they are is an easter yeah movie. and Pretty it's much, like yeah. eh. <laughs> and it's kind of disappointing because like people people like obsessed over those numbers and what they mean and then like when you got to the end of the series it was like uh, you, they actually meant fuck all it was just <laughs> <laughs> well, i it's kind of like it was an introduction to conspiracy, basically. And right. it's like, it's conspiracy theory. And there's people that have these conspiracy theories of like, oh, I see this symbol everywhere and stuff. So that's basically what they did is they, they yeah. said, okay, let's take a string of numbers and let's put them fucking everywhere. Right. And like the conspiracy theorists that believe like in real life, not like on the show, I mean that really believe in, like, these kind of, like, oh, there's these symbols everywhere, they don't really have an answer for that themselves either. It's just like, don't you see this is everywhere? It must be this big thing, but there's never an answer to it. And that's what gets those people addicted to those conspiracies, and I think it's introducing an aspect of that into Lost. So it's like, there really, I don't think there could be a satisfactory answer for what the numbers are. It's just a fun Easter egg hunt. Right. Because they're everywhere. I mean, <laughs> like, there's a point, like, what was it, in, in the last episode of the season I was just watching today, there's a scene where Hurley's driving his car to, like, yeah. the airport, and the car, like, busts in the middle of the road, and the yes. gauges flash into the numbers. Yes. 
Like, it goes, his car drops down immediately to, like, four miles an hour. And it's like the mileage gauge flashes to, like, 42. It's like the numbers, they're all there. They're just everywhere, like, constantly. Like, you know, we know it's flight 815, which are two of the numbers, 8 and 15. But it's also from gate 23, which is another one of the numbers. It's just everywhere. And then, like, Kate talking about the the bounty that, you know, was, was placed on her head that that guy betrayed her in Australia for the money was for twenty three thousand yeah. dollars right it's another it's just the numbers are just everywhere and that's that's kind of cool you know like even if they don't lead to a big story point just the fact that they're everywhere well is they make it like early's entire like plot point so it's kind of annoying from that perspective I, it could be like, I, I understand people that, that, that find that like annoying, but as I said, like it's, it's, you know, you could say that, that, that they don't mean anything, or you could just say that just like a real conspiracy, you never find out what they mean. It's the same kind of thing. It's, they're just a mystery that's there. Like, and, and I like that. I, I enjoy that this is like a weird coincidence that you see constantly. Mm hmm. There's more of that to come, too, with the numbers <laughs> throughout the seasons. There's more of that to come with the numbers throughout the series. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, next question is, I already asked, how does the show hold up to your memory of it? But how does the show hold up to today's TV standards? Like, do you think this holds up to what, you know, TV is today? I'd say surprisingly pretty damn well. Yeah. Again, it's all about the characterization. Uh... Like, it's funny, like, I, I don't know. I forgot I, I, how I, funny the show was, speaking of funny. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is pretty, it definitely has, like, good humorous moments, especially, like, anything involving Sawyer. <laughs> yeah. There was one episode I thought was kind of dumb, but there was one episode I thought was kind of dumb, but it was also a funny episode, so I'm going to bring it up. It was the one where Sawyer was getting harassed by that boar, because it was just, like, <laughs> funny, like, seeing so. it was just funny seeing Sawyer be being like stalked and harassed by a boar, even though that was pretty much the episode. And I was just like, okay, this episode's kind of dumb. But I was like, it is funny to like a, lo- a lot of stuff with Sawyer, even though like it, even though like he he is like this tragic character. You know, you're supposed to feel sympathy, but he, he also ends up like being the butt of a lot of jokes on the show. I think there's a lot of like meta humor in the show that like, yeah, I don't know if I picked up on it as much when it first aired as I do now. Like. I knew it was there, but I don't know if I picked up on it as much as I do now. Like how much there is. Like, you know, just in the, in the last couple episodes, you know, just cause they're fresh on my mind. Arst, the character of Arst that shows up, you know, yes. rest in pieces. Arst. Arst, uh, <laughs> Arst inexplicably becomes sort of a, a major character at the very end of the season for some reason. But he's like a meta joke because yeah. he keeps getting pissed off. By these people, and he, he's talking about how, like, like he's, oh, I'm a high school teacher, I know what clicks are. So you, oh, yeah, you yeah. guys, you have this click. Yeah, it's it's a commentary on the fact that throughout the season, we see, like, all these, like, basically, like, extras, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. They're, they're not, they're not even, like, really characters, because you, you, you see them, like, these random people who have, like, maybe a few moments of screen time, and arts, like, actually represents those people to yeah, the main exactly. cast. It's yeah, exactly. It's a meta commentary. <laughs> On the on the show itself, yes, <laughs> yeah. It's like they're they're going like, yeah, we realize that you know it's a show with like forty something survivors from this section, and that you're only really paying attention to like eight of them. We yeah. re- we <laughs> recognize that, and we're addressing it directly, you know. <laughs> and I thought that was funny. They did the same thing with Steve slash Scott. <laughs> Because realistically, they they couldn't they they couldn't make a show where they can fully flesh out and have you care for like forty two people. That was not going to happen. At least not up front. You know, I think no. by the by the time the series runs to an end, if you were to like really go through and detail it in your memory and go through every character that matters and lost, you'd probably would come up with around forty two characters. But it's that's going through the entire run of six seasons. Right. Right. There's characters that we don't haven't met yet. You know, like lots of characters that we haven't met yet that become important 
there's at least four major characters from the tail section of the plane in season two. Yes. That are, are like integral that like we haven't met yet, you know? And then there's the others, which we, we've, we've met one by name and seen like a few others. And that's right. it, you know? And there's a whole bunch of them. Especially like one who we haven't seen in the season who becomes basically just as integral as like the, as like the main, like as, as integral to series is like Jack, Jack, Kate, and, uh, Saeed, you know, like the big three is what I like. To yeah, call there's, there's, there's a bunch of them. And then there's characters. Uh, Jack, Kate, and Locke. I mean, the big three. And then there's so characters like them. that aren't even on the <laughs> island that are like in, in flashbacks yeah. and stuff. Kind of like, you know, Jack's father is in this season. There's characters like that that are like integral to the story. Like a bunch of them, you know? So it's like by the time you get to the end, yeah, there's, there are probably well over 40 characters that you would know by name and that are important to the story. But, but it, it is, up front, it, they can't give you that, you know? But yeah, it was nice that they actually like addressed the fact that there were like all these characters that they were essentially ignoring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I said, they didn't just do it with Ars, they did it with that Steve Scott character too. Yeah. Where they, where they like nobody could remember his name. Name. Yes. Like it was always like, oh, I thought his name was Scott, but it was actually Steve. And and then they created like a backstory for him too. <laughs> like, oh, he was, you know, he had like a he was going to Australia because he was picking up something for his dad, or you know, like they went to this thing, and it's like he's at that point he's already dead. Like he's he's yeah. already irrelevant. And what's funny about that is I think like just like one or two episodes before that happened, like Boone was. I think it was no, maybe it wasn't Boone. Maybe it was. Uh, I think it was Boone. I don't know, it might have been somebody else, was directly talking about red shirts in Star Trek. Yes. And was explaining that to another character, like what a red shirt was. Yes, they were. And, and then they had a red shirt. <laughs> Ar- Arnst was a red shirt. Yeah, Ar- Ar- Arst was a red shirt, but so was like Steve slash Scott was a red yes. shirt, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it's funny, like how they directly address that. Like there's, there's another scene, like several seasons in that I, I, I can't remember the exact details of. I think it's like season three or four where they had a bunch of characters that got, kind of died in rapid succession and Sawyer was reacting to each death like it was the biggest tragedy. And it's like, we had no idea who any of these characters were. <laughs> and it was just kind of funny when it aired and now kind of understanding even more so how meta the jokes are about that in the show makes it kind of like yeah this is kind of like a it's not like a mistake of the show it's it's like a direct wink and a nod from the showrunners to us right exactly to the people watching it they're going like yeah yeah we had to kind of skip over this character but we're gonna make a little funny joke about it here you know Right. <laughs> right, exactly. So I end up liking that. I also really like comedy wise, like, you know, bes- besides like you were talking about the Sawyer storyline with the boar, just Sawyer in general, he's a, he's a great butt of a joke. Like, well, yeah, like there's another. And I think it works so well because he deserves it. Like he's such a jackass. Well, yeah, he deserves these constant moments of comeuppance. And he gets them constantly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like, like I said, there's like another funny thing too, where you know, uh, you know, Charlie is taking Claire care, taking care of Claire's baby, and the baby is constantly crying, and Charlie can't soothe it. And then, as soon as the baby comes within earshot of Sawyer, it becomes happy. And and there's a point where it's only happy when it's hearing Sawyer's voice. And so, like, <laughs> Charlie is following Sawyer around, and he's kind of like running away from Charlie and the baby. <laughs> so he was like, like, what do you want? And he's like, keep yeah. going. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of my favorite ones, and I, br- I brought this up to you before, not on the show, though, was uh, there's an episode, I think, like, maybe episode three or four or something. Where, like, there's boars going through the fuselage. Yes. And they're, cause there's dead bodies in there and they're, they're going and eating the dead bodies. And when they first hear them going through the fuselage, they're like, is somebody in there, like, raiding it? And then, like, Jack says, like, oh, probably Sawyer. And then Sawyer's like, I'm right behind you, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Because that was already at the point where they're pretty much uh, blaming Sawyer for everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, it's funny because he, he is a sympathetic character when you get to know him. And, and, 
And like in, in my tweets about the show, when I've been rewatching it, I, I brought up how I watched this with a friend before. Like I was catching him up. I think, I think the show might have been on like, was about to go into season five and it was like during summer and I was catching my friend up on the show so he could watch, like be caught up to watch it with me, the, like the regular episodes. And, um, when he was watching Sawyer at the beginning, he was like, Oh, I hate this guy. He's such a jackass. Like, and I'm like, Oh, I think you're going to start to like him. And he was like, I'll never like him. And then like, you know, I weighs in. He's like, yeah, okay. I like him. And he, just, he did the same thing with, with Jamie in Game of Thrones. Like when I was catching him up on that show. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> like he yeah. was like, Jamie, I hate that guy. He's such an asshole. And then I'm like, yeah, oh, remember Sawyer? I think you're going to start to like him. And he's like, I never going to like him. Yeah. Cause Jamie Lance is another Sawyer-like character, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's very yeah. much. He's, he's medieval Sawyer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, but yeah, it's 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 interesting how how that character how he becomes sympathetic. But before he becomes sympathetic, he's just a pit of of bad luck, basically. Like little, and it's never like major things. It's always like little petty things keep well, happening yeah, you, to him. You just you just <laughs> also like his attitude. Like before you get to know, you just like wonder, you know, why the hell what co- what the hell compels him to act like that? You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> it's like he just keeps acting like a dick, and he keeps getting. Getting karmatically slapped for it. Yes. Like over and over and over again. And it's kind of funny, like watching it back again, you know, not, with, pers- with a lot more perspective, having gone through the whole show and stuff and knowing that the path, it's kind of like, again, it's kind of like a wink and a nod from the showrunner. It's like the, sh- the showrunner is kind of slapping Sawyer around going, come on, Sawyer, get back on track. Yeah. Yeah. Get back on track, Sawyer. And, you know, us having watched the show before and now watching it again, it's like we're seeing it from that perspective, too. Because we know who Sawyer is already. We already know who he turns out to be, what his what he actually is and stuff. And so we're basically feeling the same way. Like, come on, Sawyer, stop being such a dick. Get back on track. And so we're kind of like right there along with it. It goes with that kind of meta commentary, like I had mentioned. But, yeah. That was the second question. The third question, because we already addressed how it holds up to our memories and how it holds up by t- uh, today's TV standards. But the third question is, uh, how is the show watching it now without expectations? Because I remember when I was talking to some people about rewatching the show, there's still a lot of hate for Lost out there. People that are pissed off about the way the show ended. Oh, yeah. And I said, well, one of the best things, and they were like, I'll never rewatch it because of that. And I'm like, but that doesn't make sense if you think about it, because if you rewatch it now, you're going to rewatch it knowing that these mysteries that you were invested in aren't going to pay off. So it shouldn't be an issue for you anymore. Right. It's not like you're going to fool yourself into going, oh, this time they're going to answer my question. (laughs) Yeah. I'm finding that rewatching it, knowing, knowing like where things are going, like I can kind of like laugh at the dead ends now instead of like getting like totally obsessed with them. Like, yes. so I can, I can, I can laugh about the numbers because I know now that it's a dead end. It's, it doesn't mean anything ultimately. So I don't see, I, I think, I think what happens is for the first watch, you do get invested, you do get emotionally invested in this stuff. So for somebody who like, probably like took took the numbers and was like you know dissecting them between episodes you know going okay what does this mean how's this connected to the dharma initiative how's this connected to this and that and for that to not have paid off at the end i could see like getting like upset about that sure but on a second watch you already know so there's no reason to get invested or invent theories or anything so you can just laugh it off yeah unless you're like my mom (laughs) who has completely forgotten everything that's happened in the show (laughs) and is now like almost in a lucky way able to rewatch it as if it's the first time she's watching the show (laughs) which is hilarious like watching her like getting all like shocked when something happens and i'm like you've seen this whole show but unless you're like my mom in that way a rewatch of Lost is going to be a rewatch without expectations. You're I'm not just, going to expect certain answers because you already know which questions are right. answered and which ones are not. Right. You know, that's that's already come and begun. There is a lot that I have forgotten, but I remember the broad strokes. Yeah. Okay, I, I remember like basic. I remember the broad strokes of the plot and where things generally go. Uh, so you know, uh, there's not going to be like many surprises for me here. 
Yeah, definitely. That that's and that's it makes it kind of interesting to watch. You have a very different perspective watching it because, like I said, I have rewatched this show a few times, but I've never rewatched it after finishing it. You know what I mean? Like I, oh, I rewatched yeah. like the first three seasons to catch our first four seasons. Like I said, to catch my friend up on the show before the fifth season, but I'd never rewatched it after season six. I haven't rewatched any of these episodes. I've only, I only watched before this rewatch. I only watched all these once. Yeah. So it's and like, it. I, I, like I've rewatched a few of them, but it was all before the show ended. I don't, I don't generally rewatch stuff just yeah. because there's always something new to, to move on to and watch. <laughs> there's so yeah, much so else to watch. Yeah. There's so, there's so much else to watch. So I generally, Rarely do I go back and rewatch things. Uh, certainly not a TV show like, like movies. Like if I really love a movie, I'll, I'll, I'll rewatch it. A TV show is like a bit more of an ask of my time. So I don't generally rewatch series. Isn't it weird how things work out like that? Cause think about like music, for example. How many times have you listened to some of your favorite songs? You know? Oh, over and over <laughs> and over. Again. Yeah. Like millions of times maybe you've listened to certain songs, you know? Continuing even yeah. now and into the future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> yes. it's, and then and then like you'll have a favorite show and you've seen an episode once. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of funny like how that works out. You know, well, it's I mean, all, yeah, time it's all has relative. To, a big part to do with it. You yeah, know, yeah. Obviously. It's all relative to how much time it takes you. A song takes you a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah. Songs are also kind of more passive too. Like you can listen while you're working out or while you're on the bus or Lost Lost the Series is gonna take me from you know the beginning of this month all the way to the end of May. So it's 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 quite a difference in time there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. An episode versus a song is like an episode is forty five minutes, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a song minutes. is four minutes. <laughs> yeah. So it's like ten times as long. Still though, I mean you hear a song like thousands of times, millions of times maybe, versus, you know, an episode only being, say, ten times longer than a song, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's it's kind of disproportionate still, but it's it's just kind of interesting. It, it's definitely the time investment is the main reason, but it's interesting how that works out, you know? It is interesting. You're right. <laughs> I've rewatched Lost, I think. I rewatched the first season several times because I got lots of people caught up on Lost. Like, I, I got to the mid-season finale of season one and then got, like, four different people caught up on that show, you know? Nice. And, and then they were watching it with me, you know? And then from that point on. And then I finished season one and I got somebody else caught up on it, I think. Like, like right after that. So I went through the season one again, and then I didn't rewatch anything from Lost until, like, like I said, after season four, when I caught my friend Matt, I caught him up on the show by, like, binging it with him. And so, like, I rewatched the first four seasons, but I never rewatched seasons five or six, and I've never rewatched it since like, you know, the show ended. So it's, it is kind of, as much as I, I thought like, oh, well, I, I've rewatched these before, so it won't be that different to me. It's like, it still is, you know, like it, 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 it's very different when expectations are taken out of the question. You know, when I know how things wrap up in the very end and I know which mysteries are important. And like you said, which mysteries are dead ends. It completely changes the way you watch the show. So it's kind of, it's kind of cool watching it like this. Like we talk about the big time investment it takes to sink into a show like this but i'm really glad we're doing this i have to say because i'm really enjoying this this is pr some of my favorite tv viewing right now <laughs> is is rewatching these episodes of lost mm -hmm. yeah definitely so yeah so let's talk a little bit about we've talked about these three questions let's talk about some of kind of the different things that have happened in the season that we've liked or things that we've picked up on and noticed I'll start off with, like, as I was tweeting out messages again, I'm remembering, this is a, a negative, but I'm remembering, man, Kate's episodes are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't necessarily Her backstories, agree with... at least. Not, not not necessarily her island activities. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with that assessment. Uh, obviously, they they were trying to set up Kate as being a complicated character, being, be, being a little more than what she appears to be, you know? Yeah. So they tried 
to make her, you know, like, like make her a little more interesting than just being like the, the girl next door. Yeah. Well, the thing that's interesting in her island story, I like, I don't think her island story is boring. She's the girl next door who, who also may, like, may be like a little bit dangerous. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's <laughs> interesting. Whereas like in her backstories are like, have no levity at all to them. Right. They're just straight up like, here's Kate just acting mostly irrationally, you know, <laughs> <laughs> being kind of uh, moody all the time and stuff. And it's like, uh, if, she, if she had some of the levity that she has in her island story, I think that would make it a little bit better. But yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, there in her backstory, in her flashbacks, there's like, there's no levity. You're right. Yeah. And then like Locke is a completely different story because his, his character and his backstory, there's, there's like initially, when you first start his, his flashback story, it starts funny and then yeah. it becomes tragic as it goes on. And with each new episode of his backstory, it's like more fucked up and tragic. It's funny because like at first they do like an inversion because they introduce him on the island as like this, this mysterious badass. And it's almost yeah. set up, it's almost set up to make you wonder what his backstory is like he's a special forces agent is he a special or... forces agent is he like CIA you know like why does he have all these knives and then they flash back and, and you find out like he's he's just a normal person he, he, he's, so like, he's, like, he's was... like a no he's like a nobody you know what was so great though was the, his very first flashback scene he was talking to somebody on the phone and it was like close cropped in yes. so you could only kind of see his face and he's talking on the phone and the person on the phone was referring to him as colonel and they're talking this stuff and it's you're like oh shit he's like a general or so, you know he's like a, he's a colonel in this Military it was and... continuing to feed the expectation that they planted in your mind until they did the reveal. Yeah, they, yeah. they pull out and they reveal <laughs> like, oh, he's working at this office job. Yeah, and yeah. of course, of course, that episode has a much bigger reveal at the very end, which is one of those one of those moments yeah, that only those, Lost like, does oh, so well. Moments. Those like what the fuck moments. Yeah, because it it this is part of, like one of the brilliance of it because it it pulls like a double twist because because they plant this idea that you know that that he has like that yeah like like he he's maybe like part of the army or CIA and then they feed into that until they do like the the twist reveal that he he is just a normal guy working in an office. He's working at a box company. He's basically he's basically on the office. Yeah, he's basically on the <laughs> office. And then they pull a double twist that you don't see coming because they didn't even hint at it to where like he's not supposed to be walking around on that island because he's crippled. Well, they they did hint at it. Like there's there's some clues in there. That, there's like, there's you know, there's clues, but you wouldn't know on your first. Oh yeah, viewing, well, obviously you haven't yet been trained by Lost to expect weird what the fuck things yet. Yeah, this this is probably. Like, like the first big myth. Come to think of it, this is probably like the first big mystery they introduce. Is yeah, besides is Locke, the monster. Yeah, outside of the monster, like okay, so the monster is first, but like this is the second like big mystery. Is like okay, there's a monster, and how the hell is Locke walking around now? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they they do because they open up on Locke the first time you see him. It's a close up shot of his foot, and he's wiggling his toe, and he looks at it, and and he has kind of like a surprised expression, but you're not trained you're not trained to pay attention to that you just think he's shell-shocked from the like he's like what am i doing here yeah you just think he's shell-shocked and he's just waking up you know and confused you're not yeah. you're not looking you're not trained to look for those clues yet yeah <laughs> this is uh that's gotta be i i think that episode walkabout has to be probably the best episode of the first three seasons uh yeah that's definitely like if i had to if we had to go through the best episode of the first season i would say walkabout um i think most people would yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's such a yeah. good episode. It's, it's not just his backstory, which his backstory was great on many different levels, including that big what the fuck moment at the end. But it's not just that. It's, it's like the events on the island too are like just really strong. There's yeah. a lot of humor in that episode. There's a lot of like, you know, I, I think I, I, if I remember correctly, that's the episode with, uh, like I said, with Sawyer, like, you know, when, when Jack makes the thing where he's like Sawyer and Sawyer's like, I'm right behind you, jackass. Yeah. Yeah. That's the episode. I think that, that I th believe that might have been walking about as well there's there's like uh there's lots of different little aspects of the episode it's that are definitely really the episode that establishes Locke as one of like the most interesting characters on the show yeah definitely like i know like for a lot of people myself included Locke became like my favorite character 
Yeah. It's interesting how they play with characters, though, because one of the things that I always use to, like, explain the way Lost did a good job with having a big ensemble cast is that they introduced all of the characters as kind of cliches and tropes. Yeah. They're like, oh, here's your Iraqi soldier. Here's your fat guy. Here's your doctor that, you know. Here's the girl next door. You exactly. Know? It's it's like these very simple <laughs> tropes. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then they expand upon it, and then they start twisting it and they start they start like giving new things so like for instance Locke starts out as like oh he's this mysterious badass then you get his backstory and you realize oh he's this tied to something fantastical going on on the island but then as the season goes on you start to kind of see the negative side of that because it's almost he's almost like portrayed as like shamanistic yeah. To, to a certain extent. And then, like, he helps Charlie, you know, with, like, get over his addiction. And he, he keeps spouting off these little comments here and there that make him sound like he's really wise. And you realize at a certain point is that pathetic part of him that you saw in his first flashback. That's not, like, gone. That's still a part of who he is. It's that part of him is that part that's, like, desperate to, like, to to have meaning in his life. Yeah. To have, like, a purpose. The whole point of Walkabout, you know, the whole point of that was like they were showing him trying to he was in Australia because he was trying to go on this walkabout in Australia because because he was he was trying to find some meaning or purpose to his life like he like even before the plane crash you know he was he was trying to convince himself that he had a destiny he had a reason to exist and and you can see like when he gets denied you know and he gets all irate and he screams you know don't tell me what i can't do you know mm. like that is locked like searching for a purpose, searching for a destiny, and and I think yeah yeah you, people think like Locke transforms when he gets on the island. He doesn't. He just the island the island takes the place of the walkabout where the island becomes his destiny to him. You know yeah. he takes he takes this miracle that happened to him, which is a literal miracle. You gotta give him credit. A, a yeah. literal miracle does happen to him, but he takes that and and he mistakes it for destiny. Yes. Yeah. And that's the thing is. Like, like, through the first season, we start to see what's wrong with that. And that, you know, that's ultimately what part of a big part of what leads to like Boone's death. And knowing more about the show now, we kind of know what's really behind, like what's manipulating Locke into thinking this, you know? Right. I don't want to say anything just in case anyone's watching it for the first time. No, but, don't, don't give it away, but yeah, but like it, it kind of adds like another layer of tragedy to it. It does. But the thing is like, yeah, Locke is, he's this character that's so desperate for meaning and and he just starts making big mistakes like especially towards the end of the season in his like pursuit of this meaning like i said he finds this hatch and he gets completely obsessed with it yes even even though like the hatch itself you know it may be it may actually be like meaningless you know yeah but he, but he gets obsessed with it like convinced that like there's some grand meaning to its existence and that he has to open it you know yeah to the point where, like, he, initially he's trying to hide it from everybody, you know? And that's what leads to Boone's death, because he has Boone working with him, and, and, and he's hiding it from everybody, and he's doing the stuff with Boone out, you know, to try and get this hatch open, and, and that obsession leads to Boone's death. Yes. And, and, um, I'll transition us from Locke here to Jack. Because yes. the show, we've, we've talked about the show being about, like, a dichotomy of two different things. Yeah, Jack is positioned as, like, Locke's opposite. Yeah, they're like this, they're the opposites, but in a, in a sense, they're like the same, two sides of the same co coin, kind of, you know? They're, they kind right. of fit into that expression. Locke finally said it in the, in the season finale. Oh, yeah, they spell it where out. Where he you. referred to it exactly, which is, he said, you know, which is a big theme of the show, too, which is where he said that Jack, you're a man of science and then jack says well then what are you he says me i'm a man of faith and that's like a big theme of the show i mean there's even like an episode title later on that's man of science what man brings of faith. that on is because after lock after lock almost gets killed by the smoke monster based on you know lock basically basically ignoring everything and walking to it he tries to give it a big squishy hug yeah he tries to you know basically lock lock acting irrationally and Jack not understanding. Jack confronts Locke, and basically Jack, Jack Jack just lays it out for him. Jack says, "Look, you gotta tell me what's going on in that head of yours." And so Locke 
Capit reciprocates. He, he, he says, okay, you want to know what's going on in my head? And he tells Jack everything he believes about the island. And Jack mm-hmm. is just kind of like stunned. Jack is kind of like, this guy is completely out of it. You know, like that's what Jack's thinking. And, and, you know, so like, so, and so that's what prompts Locke to say, you know, like, you're a man of science. And Jack still kind of like, kind of, kind of like not believing anything he's hearing is kind of like, well, then what does that make you? <laughs> he's like, oh, I'm a man of faith. And Jack yeah. is just like, holy fuck. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, to a point, so religious to a point. zealot in, in, a, in a sense. Yeah. yeah. To a point where like, uh, to like, uh, to like shortly after, like, Jack's talking to Kate and Kate's going, if, and Jack goes, if we survive, survive this we're gonna have a lock problem yeah yeah this isn't to say that like <laughs> lock, that, that jack is perfect and lock lock is flawed because yeah. jack is plenty flawed himself yeah jack is plenty flawed jack is interesting because he's flawed in the way that he has to succeed all the time no matter what you know like he he will not give up on something until until he wins until he succeeds yeah you see that multiple times throughout the season where when he when he's doing something like like his he's a doctor by trade and so there's this one great scene in the flashback where he is in the operating room working on this patient that his dad fucked up and and the patient dies in the operating room and Jack refuses to stop he refuses to call it you know it it's is, a scene is, that's kind of repeated in in like other yeah. instances in the show as well yeah it's repeated in other instances of the show as well like uh. Charlie, for example. Yeah, yeah, with like, yeah, that's who I was thinking of. Yeah, with Charlie, when they find Charlie, uh, who who was hung by Ethan, and by all appearances, uh, Charlie is dead. You know, he suffocated, and Jack is trying to revive him, and Kate is just like in tears, and she's, you know, Kate is basically he's basically just hammering on Charlie's he's chest hammering, at that point. Yeah, at that point, he's just like punching. And it just Charlie's seems hopeless, chest. and you're you're kind of looking at Jack as like almost psychotic at that point. And Kate is basically going to Jack going, stop, stop, he's already dead, you know? Yeah, it's a powerful scene. Cause yeah, I it's remember a powerful the, scene. I remember the first time I watched it, you just really believed Charlie was dead. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like, man, and Jack just not giving up was kind of frightening. It was like, Jesus Christ, you know, like, just stop. Yeah. And then yeah. you realize this one time, which, you know, in many other instances we've seen has not been the case, but in this case, him not giving up actually paid off. I think this is the only time in the season that pays off. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's complicated because it means that, that if Jack had been, if he didn't have that flaw, Charlie would have died at that yes. point. So be- because of that character flaw, Charlie survived basically, which makes it really complicated because it reinforces like a bad, a bad trait on Jack's part. Yes. And it that's does. just his inability to let go. Yeah. That makes him such a fascinating character. It also makes him, it's a big part of what makes him a giant dickhead, <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't, I didn't pick up on as much my first time watching through. I think cause he's, he's kind of your guide to the episode. He's your main character per se. Well, he's the first, he's the first character you meet. Yeah. So, so in a sense, he's <laughs> you know? the one that you identify with the most. So like you kind of like let some of his negative traits skip by, but when you're watching it again, it's like, God, like, the one that, that that got me that just happened when we were watching it was the, you know, taking the dynamite out of, like, Kate's bag and putting it in his backpack. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's like, dude, you you agreed to, like, draw straws, and then you just well, had that, to have it your way Kate, anyways. That was Kate's argument. Kate was like, exactly. you know, we agreed, and then, and then, and then, like, uh, Jack just basically says to her, you know, well, you know what, I disagreed, and I made a choice. And Kate was like, it, it wasn't your choice to make. And then, like, Jack comes back with something like, you know what, everybody wants me to be the leader and make decisions until they don't like those decisions. Yeah, <laughs> so which, there's truth to it, but at the same time, it's like, I think a lot of other people are like, Jack, you shouldn't be handling dynamite. You're the island's only fucking doctor. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> you're essential. Like, people should be jumping in the way of bullets aimed at you, you know, at this point. Not an offense <laughs> to uh, Kate, but Kate is a lot less essential to the oh, island yeah, than, you know, than Jack Everybody is. else is more expensive than Jack is for the yeah. survival of the other residents, you know? Because, you know, if somebody gets injured, nobody else is going to be able to treat them. Uh- <laughs> 
But Jack just marches straight ahead, puts himself in danger first. Like, it's it's almost like, you know, like, I wonder how it would have been perceived if this came out now. With him basically, like, taking that right away from Kate is almost being kind of sexist in a way. It's right. like he's attracted to her, so he's taking away her choice to, to put herself in danger. You know, and, and taking that, like, I wonder kind of how that would have been perceived if this had been new now with that happening. It's interesting because I remember reading, uh, reading way back, uh, originally they were going to kill off Jack in like the first episode or something. Yeah, he was basically what, where the pilot died in the first episode. That was going to be Jack. And, and basically Kate was going to be the main character. Yeah. And, and I'm actually glad that they didn't go through with that, you know, because how weird would that be? Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if that would have worked out. I think it works better with Jack in the picture. Yeah. Not because he's a man or anything like no. that, but because because he's so flawed. It's specifically because he's so flawed that makes it work out well with him in the picture. Right. Kate's flaws are, are a little different. Like, you know, there, she definitely has her flaws too, but, you know, like Jack's flaws are like dangerous. Like he's putting himself into some very dangerous situations that he shouldn't be, that are kind of irrational to be doing since he's the only doctor on the right. island, you know? Kate isn't running headlong into danger or like or like you know doing doing anything that that would potentially put anybody else in danger yeah yeah exactly and and so jack doing that kind of stuff makes him like very flawed which makes it more interesting yeah yeah that's uh jack basically in a nutshell he's he's as Locke is is driven to purpose jack is driven to i guess you could say success but it's not like out of a sense of ego, it's more like out of a desperation himself. Like he can't let go, he can't give up. Well, it's mostly uh, it's 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 mostly daddy issues. A lot of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I I find out like uh like like that's the theme. Like everybody in the show has daddy issues. That's even like one of the first episodes. Like I think it's Jack's second episode or something. It's titled like "All the Best Cowboys Have Daddy Issues" or something. And you find out going through the show, literally everybody has daddy issues. Most of the characters when we meet if if we if if we meet their dads their dads are assholes uh yeah. you know like all the characters whose dads we meet their dads end up being assholes that's a theme of the show even in regards to michael and walt because michael is an asshole to walt a lot of the time even though yeah. mike even though michael is genuinely trying to be a good dad he's not trying to be like like a bad father, but he just doesn't yeah. know how to be a father, and so Walt's certainly not making it easy on it. <laughs> yeah, and Walt certainly doesn't make it easy. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> but you can even see the theme reflected there. But even though Michael is genuinely trying, I like we just started in the season getting those kind of like weird connections, like yes. with Sawyer and Jack, like Sawyer yeah, having yeah. Jack's father and stuff. Yeah, we get those connections. It's 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 only connection in season one where we yeah find as, out. as the show goes on they get much deeper and bigger you know yeah yeah one one, one of the facets of the show is that it, it goes it, it goes with like the theory that everything is connected that every that that you know like the kevin bacon like six degrees of separation <laughs> this is pre-mcu uh yeah everything's yeah. connected theory yeah <laughs> yeah basically it runs with that like there there's only like there's there's only so many degrees of separation between like any one person on the planet and mm -hmm. it really it really sh like sh you really find out like all these people who are strangers are connected in like surprising ways so I think this pretty much gets to a good stopping point for our discussion. There's lots of characters that we didn't really address that much, but I mean, outside of like just going through and reiterating their stories, there isn't a lot of fertile ground to, to touch on them yet. No, you know? I, no, I, yeah, right. I just want to talk about the stuff that's like we could talk about Jin and Sun, but it's kind of, it's, you know, right. It's not really that necessary, I don't think, in our discussion to do that. <laughs> right. Like I said, we could talk about Saeed. Uh, one of the, one of the big things, I guess, with Saeed is, Saeed is the first character in the show to meet somebody who is not one of the original castaways. Yes. Who is not one of the 42 odd survivors of the front end of the plane crash. Yes. So he is the first character to learn that there are other people on the island. Yeah, and that, the French and that, woman. The French woman, Rousseau, who they hear yes. like a recording from like early in the season. Other than that, like, uh, other than that, like, Sa Saeed is interested there. Like I said, like, they, they kind of establish, they kind of establish, like, their, their character tiers. 
right? So, like, Jack is, like, the main character. He's the first person you meet. He becomes, like, the leader who makes, like, all the decisions. And, like, everybody, like, instantly, like, like the first thing he does is he runs out into the chaos and starts taking control of everything. Mm-hmm. You know, so he is established, like, okay, that's the main character. And, and Locke and, has quickly taken the, the role of his foil. Yeah, Locke is the role of his foil. Uh, basically, Kate, Kate becomes, like, his, Kate and, like, Kate and Saeed become, like, Jack's lieutenants, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, they become, like, his two, like, right, right hands, you know, locked to a certain extent, but Locke, Locke goes off and does his own thing, so, so he's not exactly, like, fully with Jack. Those are, like, your major characters. Yeah, you have, like, Sawyer is, like, a wild card. and Sawyer is a wild card. And then you get down to, like, a secondary tier. I would say, like, Charlie. Hurley. Hurley. You know, Michael, Jin, and Son are all on that, like, second lower tier. Mm-hmm. Where, where, like, they're important characters, but they're not always, like, they're not always, like, the kick part of the action or, like, the characters necessarily going out and putting themselves in danger. And by know? the end, some of those on positions have changed, you know? Yeah. So I won't go into all of it, but like casting on Lost is fascinating. The whole production of Lost is fascinating. If you haven't, there's like, there's features that were packed in on the DVD. There's interviews with Lindelof and Cuse and Abrams. There's all sorts of material you can read up about how Lost came to be. It's fascinating because it happened in a very short period of time. A lot of the roles were also written specifically for actors. And in almost every case, they got the exact actor they wanted. And some of them were like long shots. Like they just, it, not even necessarily because they're a really big actor, but just because it was like a, a personal favorite. And then they just never thought they'd actually get them. And right. they did. Right. Like exactly. Locke was specifically written for the actor. Oh, yeah. um, Hurley is another example. Hurley was written for the actor based on them watching him in an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm where he played a weed dealer. Really? That's yeah. interesting. And, and so they created his character based on, on that, you know? And then there's other things too. Like you can watch casting tapes where Matthew Fox, who plays Jack, auditioned for like the role of Sawyer as like a very different version of Sawyer. Oh, I think I saw that. Where he was yeah. like more like a New York style con man versus like a Southern style con man. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause I can't imagine, I can't imagine Matthew Fox trying to do a Southern accent. <laughs> oh no, no. He paid, he played him very differently, like much more intense. Uh, just like how he plays Jack Intense. <laughs> well, it's it's yeah. weird because yeah. he's like he's playing this asshole, but like in this more like almost psychopathic, like you know, uh, um, like American Psycho esque kind of way. Like he he plays him like very dark, very intense, you know. Right. It's a screen test, so obviously they never got into any of the redemption stuff or any of the explanation stuff. Right. So it's only that surface level aspect. But like he's he's not like a charming Southern con man he's like a new york wall street asshole kind of you know <laughs> but yeah the, the actor who uh dominic uh monaghan who, who plays charlie they wrote the role of charlie for him but he orig- originally also auditioned for sawyer another different version of sawyer i think that was actually i think that kind of like new york style con man was what they were originally going for with Sawyer. And then they ended up doing, when they audition uh, Josh Holloway, who ended up getting the role, that's that's when they ended up going for the Southern style, where they decided that was kind of more fitting. Right. But it's, yeah, it's fascinating. So, like, I highly recommend anybody who hasn't, check out, you know, if you can find the extras that were on the DVD sets anywhere. I don't know where they are, but if you can find those or look up some old interviews and stuff, they made this show happen in a remarkably short period of time like they wrote it very fast they cast it very fast and they put everything together just extremely fast and they did a lot of things for like the first time i think it's the first time ever that a tv show was live orchestrated for the music like that never happened before like they'd always just pre-recorded music but everything was live orchestrated so so they don't like plug in like a song here or there like they they have an orchestra playing through the entire episode every time they did they they, they scored the episode. So that's like really different from a lot of other shows on TV before then. Now, now some shows do that. Not that many, but some do it. But then, like, it was like the first time it had ever happened. 
So there, there's a lot of really fascinating stuff if you look it up about Lost, especially in its first season and how it came to be. Yeah, definitely. Also, just the fact that the the guy that greenlit the show was basically doing it because he knew his job was pretty much over anyways and was just kind of doing like a fuck it move. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny because like, yeah, ABC, like the 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 head of it, ABC greenlit the show. He basically he basically put it out like like he he wanted a show where people got, you know, where people got stranded on an island. That was that was just it. Like so, the whole the whole concept of Castaway Strip on an island did not come from Damon Lindelof or J.J. Abrams, right? It came from the head of ABC, who basically said, "Make me a show about castaways on an island." And Damon yeah. Lindelof took that. Well, it was J.J. Abrams that got it first? Yeah, J. Yeah, yeah. J.J. Abrams is the producer, and then he was introduced to Damon Lindelof. Because when he started talking to one of the other producers at ABC about what he wanted to do with it, I think it was a female producer, and she had said, oh, I got a guy I got to introduce you to that, that I think you'd get along with really well. And that was how, how Damon Lindelof got involved. Oh, okay. Right. And so, like, basically, J.J. Abrams got brought in. He pitched the idea of just doing, like, he didn't pitch a full idea for the show. Just the idea of doing, like, mysteries and making it really weird and stuff. And then immediately they said, well, let's give you Lindelof, because he was working on Alias, so he wasn't able to do. He's like, I can't develop this. Like, he's like, I, I, I could help somebody else develop it, but I can't do the work myself. I have another show. Right. Exactly. And they, and they hooked him up with Damon Lindelof. And then, as J.J. Abrams' role started shifting away and started becoming more of like a supervisor position, as he started moving back to, to Alias to work on that, Lindelof brought Carlton Cuse on because the two of them, because he had worked under Carlton Cuse on Nash Bridges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, like, Lindelof had worked as a writer on that show, that, and Carlton Cuse show ran Nash Bridges, and so Lindelof brought Cuse on as a co-showrunner once Abram was was leaving. Right. So, yeah, there's, there's tons of stuff. Like, we can't go into it all because it would take hours to go through, like, all the just interesting bits and pieces about Lost. It's a really fascinating nor show how it got off I the ground. To, nor yeah. do I want to go over all the trivia. Uh, <laughs> nor do I want to edit all that audio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if you're interested at all, look it up. It's a fascinating story how that show got off the ground and just every aspect of it was pretty fascinating. You can watch the casting tapes. There's a bunch of casting tapes out there for the, like I said, you can see Matthew Fox auditioning for Sawyer and stuff like that. It's really good stuff. But yeah, that's, that's it for the discussion this week. Final thoughts on season one. I'm happy it, how I'm, how much I'm enjoying this as like, a the, the, the lighter aspects of it are kind of surprising to me more than anything else. I, I'm surprised, uh, how well it holds up even though it's not quite as full into the mythology as we get. Uh, the mm -hmm. char it's like I said, uh, it, the characters are lost strength, and like this season proves that. Yeah, this, this show holds up. It's still great. Mm -hmm. I agree. But yeah, so that's it for this week. Next week, we're back on to the magicians, and we'll be doing stuff like that for a while until we finish season two. And then we'll do another episode like this where we talk about season two. But until then, here's what's coming up on the week ahead. A couple weeks ahead, I should say. Uh, on Wednesday, February 19th, Year of the Rabbit comes to uh, IFC. On Thursday, February 20th, Sacred Lies, The Singing Bones comes to Facebook Watch. Playing for Keeps to Sundance Now and Spectros to Netflix. On Friday, February 21st, Hunters comes to Amazon Prime. That's like it's a show about Nazi hunters. It takes place in like the 80s or 90s or 70s, somewhere like that. It's recent past, basically. And it's about Nazi hunters. And it, it looks a lot like the boys, actually, except instead of misbehaving superheroes, it's Nazis <laughs> uh, that have reintegrated themselves into society and they're war criminals and these Nazi hunters are hunting them down. But anyways, that looks really good. It's actually uh, stars Al Pacino and it's from Jordan Peele is producing it. Star Wars The Clone Wars returns to Disney+. Plus. Gentified comes to Netflix, as does Pure to Seven. That's all on Friday, February 21st. On Sunday, February 23rd, The Rookie returns to ABC. When Calls the Heart to Hallmark. When Hope Calls to Hallmark. Better Call Saul returns on AMC, as does The Walking Dead. On Wednesday, February 26th, SEAL Team returns to CBS. It's Personal with Amy Hogart comes to True TV. I Am Not Okay With This debuts on Netflix. On Thursday, February 27th, 
Followers comes to Netflix. Altered Carbon Season 2 comes to Netflix. That's interesting because the very premise of Altered Carbon is that the main character can be put into different bodies. Like, his consciousness can be put. It's, it's hard sci-fi. Yeah. And he, he can be put into different bodies. And the first season was, uh, like, Joel Kinnaman was the main actor. I watched, like, the first episode of that. It's a, you know, some people didn't like it. I, I actually really liked it. I like the show. I think, like, visually it's stuck. Stunning. Oh, yeah. I think it looks Visually really good. Stunning. There's there's some aspects that are kind of questionable, but I think in the end, I really enjoyed it. I only watched the pilot, to be fair, but conceptually, I thought it was a mess. But it it, it starts good. to make sense the more you watch it. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it's very high concept, and so like the first episode, you're kind of just hit over the head with all these high concept things, and it's like, okay, I don't get any of this, you know? Right. But then as it goes on, it starts to you start to kind of accept certain things, and certain things make more sense. Like it's a little better. And, like, there's action scenes in it and stuff that are just amazing. And the, the look of the show is amazing. And the way it ends is really cool. But, yeah, so season two, Anthony Mackie is playing the lead character. That's uh, uh, Falcon from uh, the Marvel movies. So he's going to be playing um, the main character, the same main character that was played by uh, Joel Kinnaman in the first one. It's just like I said, he can be put into different bodies. And so he's put into this different body for season two. On Friday, January 28th, Queen Sono comes to Netflix, uh, Babylon Berlin to Netflix, Unstoppable to Netflix. Sunday, March 1st, Dispatches from Elsewhere comes to AMC. And on Monday, March 2nd, Breeders comes to FX. Uh, that's like a British show. It's got uh, Martin Freeman in it. Mm. So, yeah, that's it. That's what's coming ahead. As I mentioned twice before, next week, we're going to be doing Magicians. We're going to be catching up on all those episodes we've missed out on by talking about Law. So we'll be talking about three episodes. But until then, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Tyson Gifford. You can follow Will. He is at Voxel Hero. You can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, as well as our site, The Total Screen. You can subscribe to the podcast through any major podcast client like iTunes or Pocket Cast. And the entire backlog of our podcast is available on our YouTube channel. Channel. So thank you everybody for listening. Good night. Good night. If you would like to reach out to us and make a comment, send an email to contact at thetotalscreen.com. Stay tuned to The Total Screen for the very best.